everybody, welcome back. It is my great privilege and I'm very excited to introduce to you today, who needs no introduction from me, but hey, it's the wonderful Thorn Mooney. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> Joy, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited too. I'm like, all the, it's stage fright now. Ah. <laughs> oh no! People are here to to hang out with us. It's all right. Yeah. So if you guys don't know, I'm guessing you live under a rock. Thorn Mooney is the author of Traditional Wicca. Wicca. Oh goodness, it's been a long day. Traditional Wicca, a seeker's guide and has her own channel here on YouTube and I will post all links down below once this goes live and we're going to talk about all things Wicca and the book and how I th I was interested to to talk about Wicca from a, a modern perspective with you and what some of your experiences had been first because I have a very I guess I have an outsider's perspective of how Wicca gets treated in in modern times and and for me Wicca was accessible in the beginning of my path and there were a lot of books available on Wicca and I think that happens for many people that they find it accessible and then they either stick with it or they kind of move on. Do you think sure. that's typical of, of how oh. a lot of people see it? Yeah, um, I've definitely heard people say that Wicca is um, like the starter version of witchcraft or that Wicca is a gateway um, not just to witchcraft, but to other kinds of paganisms. Um, and that totally makes sense. That was the case for me too. Um, I think, you know, for a long time when you went to like big box bookstores and you looked at spiritual new age books, because of course they didn't call them pagan or witchcraft sections at that point. You just had like new age or maybe metaphysics. The books were all about Wicca and they had Wicca in the title and they could even like not really be super duper about Wicca, but they would still use Wicca in the title because that's just what people recognized. So I think it makes perfect sense that people come in, explore it, maybe identify as Wiccan and then end up somewhere else. I think that's really common and I think that's fine. Mm. Yeah. So why do you think it it stays with certain people what is the the deep i guess the deeper wicker if that makes sense because sure. I, if, if a lot of people scratch the surface of wicker and then move on which is is one way that it happens so what do you think takes someone deeper into wicker sure that's a that's a really tricky question um because i think it's going to be different for everybody um i think that it is a very common and very normal experience to look at what's offered as Wicca, whether we're talking about popular books, popular YouTubers, things that we see in the media. It makes perfect sense to look at that stuff and spend some time with it and then go, mm, there's really not a whole lot of depth here. Um, this doesn't really speak to me. Like I'm going to go over here. Um, and unfortunately there, there gets to be kind of an, some negativity attached to that because Wicca must be shallow or Wicca must be, um, you know, it must not have any teeth to it as a witchcraft tradition. Um, and that's really unfortunate. But I think the reason that happens is because so much of Wicca is still, um, whether we really like to kind of acknowledge it or not, the core of Wicca still is very much um, initiatory. And it's very much rooted in the practice of um, not just a coven, but in kind of the deeper mysteries of just living your life over time, like spinning that wheel of the year over and over again over the course of your life and building relationships with that mythos that speak to you personally. Um, and I think that for a lot of people that just isn't appealing, whether because they don't want to work with a group, um, they don't have access to a group or any kind of um, group training or coven training, um, I think it's become a lot easier to get, but for a long time it was it was still impossible and it still is for a lot of people. Um, so I think that we have this narrative that we tell ourselves publicly and popularly that we know all there is to know about Wicca. It was all in Scott Cunningham in the 90s and we can just move on because there it all is. But the fact is, is that there's actually a lot of stuff that didn't make it into these books, even though people on the internet will tell you that it's all online anyway. Um, you know, and when I, when I first got involved in my coven, I sort of expected to see the same sorts of things. Like I expected that, 
oh, it'll be, it'll be a lot of things that I already seen before. And I was genuinely surprised to see that, no, actually there's, there's stuff here that people don't know and don't talk about. Um, and I think that's true for all religions. Like if you, if you really become a devotee, if you really spend your life in the thing, it reveals things to you that people just passing through it casually don't necessarily have access to. And that's not about gatekeeping. It's just, I think, I think that's kind of the way of things. Like how deep do you want to go? It depends on how much you want to put into it. Mm. I would be interested to know what you think about gatekeeping actually, because there has been a surge of, well, people using the word, like the, the word gatekeeping, I think I come across more now than I've heard in 10 years before that point. Um, and there is, with the advent of things like TikTok, there was a whole whole battle on TikTok of young new people versus people who were older and, and were, they, the people who were older were trying to educate in, in their mind and the, the younger people had decided that they were gatekeeping and there was a whole mess uh, oh, <laughs> between yeah. these two polar opposites. And do you feel like, where do you stand on gatekeeping? I think that there there are a few, there are a few problems there, and I think the their problem lies on both sides because on the one hand, um, I think witchcraft at its core is about power and access to power, and I think that people are entitled to that. I think that particularly marginalized communities like witchcraft is very much kind of at any point in history wherever we look at it, we see witchcraft being this tool of the marginalized. And I think that narrative is really important. So in that sense, maybe the reason why witchcraft is popular and why witchcraft is everywhere and it seems trendy right now is because people really need witchcraft because life is really hard right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm all for people having access. Um, on the other hand, there are certain things about all traditions that just by the nature of those traditions aren't going to appeal to everybody. Um, I think that we lose something when we assume that just because people um, should be able to explore things and experiment and move outside of their comfort zones and, um, you know, acquire that power, we lose something when we assume that, that that's necessarily going to look the same for everybody. I think that's where we get in trouble. Um, so when I say, for example, that Coven Wicca isn't for everybody. That's not because I'm an elitist and I don't want people to explore joining a coven. It's because you might just not like my personality. You might just not like my coven mates or how we do things or, you know, you do you. The analogy that I use is dating. Like, you know what? I'm like, I really, I like men. I'm into men. I'm heterosexual. But I tell you what, I'm real picky when it comes to my men. Okay. I picked one that was good. There's a lot of them I don't like, right? Mm -hmm. Witchcraft kind of can be the same way. You yeah. can be into something, but it doesn't mean you have to be into everything. Um, so that's one part of it. Other parts are, I think that there's definitely, when you saw, when you talked about kind of the older folks and the younger folks, and that's both chronological age, but also just how much experience they have in these communities. I think that older folks do the community a disservice when they assume that younger folks or newcomers aren't serious. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big problem. Um, but at the same time, I think younger folks and newcomers are also sometimes guilty of assuming that nobody can teach them anything. Mm -hmm. um, we have this idea that Oh, well, that's how they did things in the 70s and 80s. And we don't need to hear that anymore because, you know, like this is a new generation. Mm -hmm. And like, honestly, like I think those folks are missing out on something mm -hmm. at the same thing. At the same time, there are older people, there are elders um, who have been around who refuse to relinquish leadership to younger folks and this this incoming generation that has a lot of really powerful, important things to say. So I think there has to be give and take on both sides. Um, sometimes we toss gatekeeping around, like like that word around, like it's this definitive thing. But you know, there's that's a, it's a it's a conversation. I always find it really sad as well, in a way, because the idea of gatekeeping for me is like the gatekeepers are standing at the gates to open the gates, and and then it's become the opposite of that. And and that so that use of that word has actually made me feel quite sad because 
to me that was the image of the gatekeeper is someone who's there to like usher you on through and, and provide the answer to opening the door yeah uh, and that that's the traditional role like in my tradition that's the traditional role of the high priestess and high priest their job is not to keep people out their yeah. job is to bring people in yeah. um, but that also means working with and, and respecting the best interests of the people who they're already working with which is why it's not you know come one come all necessarily there's still some discernment going on but my job is to ensure the survival of my tradition and the preservation of those mysteries and i can't do that if i just wantonly keep everybody out because i'm a jerk <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was having a thought about when you were talking about the parallel between that that need for balance between the influx of the young generation who have things to say things to add to the conversation things to evolve it and actually what's going on in the world right now and so i was thinking about that the world is in this gra great massive flux this this churning change and none of us know where it's going to end up right now and so that's why i stopped survival <laughs> Uh, so the survival of the the mysteries of the traditions is going to be a really interesting journey because it's going through unprecedented times, massive change, and I think that witchcraft and, and branches of paganism is actually uniquely suited to the survival of that sort of shift, that sort of change because of its cyclic nature. Whereas maybe some of the, you know, the, the stoic traditions that refuse to change and shift are going to see a decline. Do you think from an inside perspective that Wicca and, and those mysteries behind it are that kind of adaptable and, and that kind of changing in these, these kind of times? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think sometimes we get a bit of a reputation for being kind of stodgy and stuck in our ways, um, particularly Gardnerians um, and Alexandrians too, but I think particularly Gardnerians were known for just like, oh no, this is how the ritual is and this is what the book says and you have to do it that way. And none of that stuff is really true. Like there's, there's a liturgy, there are traditions, um, but the fact is that your witchcraft, your Wicca is is about you and your relationship with those things and how the mysteries work through you. Um, and we all have different experiences of those mysteries. The liturgy is just a framework. The tradition is a framework. I've compared it to like a, a toolkit. Like here's your, here's your box of tools. This is what I'm giving you. Now use them to go talk to the gods and do spells or whatever it is, you know, go, go enact your true will, whatever. <laughs> um, so I do, I agree with you that we're uniquely poised, I think, for those changes. Um, the reality too, I think if you look at the history of witchcraft as a whole, and Wicca in particular, like whether we like it or not, there's a lot of change that's happened there. There's a lot of evolution in those communities and that's gonna keep happening whether we want it to or not. Again, like if I put my jerk hat on and I want things to stay the same and I wanna gatekeep and I wanna do all that stuff, I can want I can want that all I want, but things are going to change anyway, regardless of how I feel about it. Um, yeah. So I think the people who are going to survive and the people who are going to do something profound with these traditions are the people who are considering where people are right now and who's coming into the tradition, what are their needs, and it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. So I'd say we just get on board. <laughs> Well, it's always odd to me as well, because a lot, well, most witches, I'm not going to say all witches, because someone will inevitably come in the comment section and say, no, not all witches. But most witches work within cyclic thinking. They work with the cycles of the moon. They work with the wheel of the year. They work with the cycles of life, death and rebirth within their own space. And so then it's really weird to me, the idea of, no, that it has to stay the same. <laughs> so, doesn't that go against everything that we we already weave into being we know how changeable the world is and sure. we're supposed to be connected with that world it's it's not the same earth as the dinosaurs were walking around on it's not the same earth as in medieval mm -hmm. times we're in a unique stage of evolution i guess within the planet sure i think a lot of those stories about 
witches who are stuck in those kinds of frameworks, people who refuse to change. I think a lot of those stories are told by outsiders. Mm. Um, just as an example, um, I get a lot of feedback on my videos and to my book. People will say things like, oh, well, I don't like drama, so I could never be in a coven. And the assumption there is that covens are all about drama. Mm -hmm. But how can you know that if you've never been in a coven? Um, so I hear a lot of, well, I could never be a traditional Wiccan. I could never be an initiate. I could never be in a coven. I could never be a part of one of these lineage traditions because I'm too creative. I'm an individual. And the mm -hmm. assumption there is that people who are involved in those traditions aren't creative or aren't individuals or they like being told what to do. And that assumption just isn't true. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't actually know any, any Gardnerians or initiates who are out there saying like, no, no flexibility, no creativity, you know, screw you and your individuality. We're going to do exactly what's in the book. Like, I don't think those people are really out there. I think we just tell stories about them because we're afraid of them. <laughs> I bet there is an element of bad rep there because that happens to a lot of pagan groups. It's like saying all people involved in, you know, Asatru are, are, are racist. Yeah. Like, that's, can't be the case it's just that maybe either there is like a small element that is like that and they're loud and they get attention and then that kind of tars that all with the same brush or there's maybe and well that is true for at least whether or not the racists actually are involved in acid true versus whether they say they are and then that tars it with a brush versus um outs outsiders saying it about about groups for reasons I think, that you, I think what you said about being loud is also the key there um in traditional wiccan communities i think we kind of shot ourselves in the foot in the 90s um just because if you look at if you look at i think about my first experiences in like america online chat rooms when i first mm -hmm. got the internet as a kid and i would get into wiccan rooms and like sometimes people were really mean to me mm. <laughs> Um, and there were a whole lot of people who identified as initiates in various traditions who were telling me that I wasn't really Wiccan, I couldn't be really be a witch for whatever reason, and the reasons were always different. And I never forgot about that, like that always stuck in the back of my head. And I think there was a lot of that going around in previous generations. And we haven't lived that down. Mm. You know? um, and I think there are still voices out there. You know, you mentioned um, heathen communities we tend to listen to the voices that cause the most drama. And that's true in witchcraft too. And the mistake we make is thinking that those loud voices are representative. Mm -hmm. You know, like we think all heathens are racist because here are these really loud heathen racists. We think all Wiccans are homophobic or love cultural appropriation or like, you know, whatever, because you got people out there who are super loud or maybe you had a bad experience in the 90s, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but those communities are all really flexible and they're made up of individuals and we forget that yeah absolutely I, it that sort of touches on something else that drives me absolutely crazy which is this argument that there's like the real witches or the real wiccans versus like the fake ones and whilst i'm certain that there are people who I, well, well we know there are people who pretend for yeah. reason usually to sell people something to be honest like the, there was that person on instagram who was selling people plastic things from china and claiming it was spell casting and it was all nonsense um but like the overwhelming majority of people who are putting themselves out there to talk about these things are not doing that because they're getting any kind of massive recognition or massive right. financial gain from it it's like we're in the wrong section to be making like a, well a, there's one or two people who make a lot of money off it and then they tend to be from from different spheres so the beauty sphere come into witchcraft and they bring their followers with them and things like that sure sure you mean you're not getting rich on youtube <laughs> yeah, my, my, little, my little book with Llewellyn has just made me a millionaire. What do you mean? You're doing it wrong. <laughs> Gross. Um, yeah, I think those conversations are always going to be there about who's real and who's doing it the realest and who's just in it for money and who's in it for attention, which by itself is really funny because even like being pagan famous, like being a big name pagan, what does that actually amount to in like 
the grand scheme of the world. Um, a good way to think about it is like, so I work in publishing and like a print run of a book is a way of estimating like wider, wider popularity, okay? And a print run of some of these small presses, like a Llewellyn print run is like three to 5,000 books. If you're talking about some of these um, smaller like specialty presses, like think about like Scarlet Imprint, where the print run might be less than a thousand. Sometimes it's in a few a few hundred. So like if I'm a best-selling author, but I've only sold 5,000 books, that's nothing in the wider scheme of publishing. Like that's not like, and you're not making money, okay? Except again, like there are obviously exceptions. Um, but the assumption that we're all in this for attention is just like, how many, how many subscribers do you have on your YouTube channel versus how many subscribers do the people who actually turn a profit on YouTube have? Because the difference is literally millions. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not making all, all the YouTube money is not going to be, <laughs> no, I not going to be sustaining me. No. <laughs> All of this is just about people sharing their paths. I mean, I got into YouTube because I wanted friends and I wanted to be part of a community. I didn't have mm -hmm. people in my immediate life to talk to. And I wrote a book because I had a lot of things to say that weren't in other books. And I thought that my particular experience with Wicca, this particular tradition I was a part of, deserved to have a book because yeah. it doesn't have one. So I figured, okay, well, I'll do it. Maybe people will like it. Um, if I wanted to just make money, I wouldn't be spending these extra hours on YouTube for free, guys. I'd go get another job. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think oh, the, the, you're going to move, are you? Please don't knock the light. <laughs> Kitties! Kitties! <laughs> yes. Um, oh, dear. Now I'm going to be blinded by... There we go. <laughs> I'm leaving that in for everybody so everyone yeah. can know that that's Daisy doing that because she hadn't had enough attention. Oh, <laughs> Daisy. <laughs> but I think, yeah, people who are in the, like the online community, people who share things, they're in it because they love what they yeah. are talking about and they want to connect with people. And I think, again, that is really important right now because of what's happening in the world. So, the people who are at the front lines of this in the pagan or witch communities, they are here wanting to help people. They're here trying to like take, you know, take an energetic stand against what's happening, trying to keep each other safe, trying to help each other through the spiritual uh, turbulence, I suppose, really, of what's going yeah. on right now. Being a voice people can relate to, I think. Um, that to me is the most important thing. Yeah. No. Um, I had a thought that I just lost. Oh no. I'll find <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to ask, what do you think are some of the most important things that, from a spiritual perspective or a, a Wiccan particularly perspective, that are important right now that other people would need to hear or might help other people to hear? Well. I would say in our communities that, and this is really even before, before the pandemic, I think this is just, if I were to have a central message, like as a Wiccan content creator, as a pagan writer, as a pagan speaker, whatever, um, to me, the thing that is most important is that um, so much of this is about your personal experience and the work you're doing with yourself. I mean, you can collect initiations and you can take classes and get certificates and you can know everybody and you can write books and you can do all of that stuff, but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what's going on in, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting cheesy as I say this. Okay. But it doesn't have anything to do with what's going on in your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that sometimes we forget that our practices, whether they're Wiccan or, you know, you're a traditional witch or you're a secular witch or whatever, whatever brand of witch you are, like, how are you putting that into practice in your life to make it better and to make the space that we have to occupy better? 
you know, and if you're not doing those things, then like, what are you doing? Hmm. Um, Cause you can be a jerk in any tradition. <laughs> you know? like, that's fine. Um, when we're in these spaces and we fight, whether that's because so-and-so isn't a real witch or I really hate this book. I can't believe somebody would buy this or, oh my God, she's making all this money on YouTube or Patreon. Who does she think she is? Like, all of that stuff our communities are so small like mm -hmm. if i if i spent all of my energy fighting about whose brand of wicca was the realist or who was doing witchcraft the most hardcoreist like <laughs> i'd be fighting with like 20 other people and we wouldn't get anywhere because the rest of the world already thinks we're nuts like why yeah. am i gonna fight with my fellow weirdos yeah um i think we have a lot more in common than we do difference. So that's that's the thing that I would say to remember. Like, stop getting hung up on what makes us different and start thinking about like how we actually could maybe work together to, I don't know, cause change in the world. Mm. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're all really trying to do is create change in the world. And that's the whole point of spell crafting. It's the whole reason that a lot of people are drawn to uh the traditions behind because it's usually spell crafting that draws people in in the beginning like i want to be able to cast spells i want to be able to change my life i want to it's the power like you said earlier it's taking power back is quite often the case because i think a lot of yeah. people who come in they're disenfranchised already whether it be from a different religion or just things that have happened in their life and so so many people in our in our little circle of weirdos they've already had so much hardship or they've already felt ostracized or they've already felt rejected and then to carry on those feelings within our little circle is this is yeah. really strange to me and i think as i've gotten older i've, I've just learned to be like i'm just gonna sidestep this and carry on <laughs> because yeah. it always happens we carry our wounds around with us, no matter where we are. Um, I think that's definitely true. And when when I'm in those kinds of situations, because they still happen, and like I'm not, I'm not too big for that. I get petty sometimes, and I have problems, and I get involved in drama. You know what I mean? Like I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more, the longer I do this, the older I get, the more experience I have, the easier it is for me to sidestep things. And when I have trouble. What I do is I remind myself that how is this serving my practice of witchcraft? How is this fueling my craft? Is it helpful to get involved in this argument or is it, who does it serve? Does it just make me feel better because I can put my anger somewhere? Because if that's the case, then, you know, that's a conversation to have with a therapist or with a close friend. Hmm. Um, so just keeping that that central question like who does this serve is this fulfilling who i'm supposed to be and what my what my agenda is as a witch um sometimes we lose sight of those things myself included yeah and we're all people underneath <laughs> that too that we get very invested into the conversations of like who's 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 the realist witch and who's a, who's doing this the it's like we're all people underneath guys sure. <laughs> like we're all sure. fallible we all make mistakes we we all you know eat drink and well, sleep I, I think we're all insecure too yeah. i mean the reason, the reason the real witch conversation keeps coming up is because i think deep down almost all of us are a little worried that we're not real witches yeah we want like i think i think deep down most of us that's that's something like am i doing this right am i are my experiences real or am i making them up hmm. um i think everybody has those fears buried somewhere and maybe they're a little closer to the surface so those conversations about who's real like they hurt they push all of those buttons hmm. um, I, and i think yeah. yeah just acknowledging that that's a reality yeah i've had conversations with multiple people and I've had that experience myself. And you're like, am I nuts? <laughs> like, yeah. that, 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 like, am I hearing voices in my head and I'm a crazy person right now? Or is this, and I think you do get those big moments of confirmation along your spiritual path, which help. Um, and you, there are synchronicities that you just, it's a little bit too hard to just say, oh, it was just 
pure luck that all those six things happened in a row now you know um but they are massively personal again yeah you might have that experience and that might be like oh no this can't be a coincidence but that doesn't mean that i have to believe you or agree with you mm. like your personal experience if i if i get on the internet and i say that i've had this this divine realization through my relationship with a god and i'm sharing it and it helps me to process it or whatever um doesn't mean that other people have to back me up or agree with me um i think sometimes we we get a little overexcited about our sharing and then we're hurt when people don't necessarily back us up but again like that's the nature of those capital m mysteries it's about you and your experiences was this thing meaningful for you mm. and why are we so concerned if it's not meaningful for other people mm. how does how do you think that works in a coven environment <laughs> when you have lots of different people with lots of different experiences and then people come together and presumably it's more accepting as long as the coven is in a healthy in environment with one another yeah so the cool thing about being in a coven after i've just told you that it's all about you know your personal experience and other people don't necessarily have to find things meaningful themselves i think there's a real danger in magical communities my magical partner calls it believing your own bullshit <laughs> Um, where we basically like we create kind of an echo chamber in our own magic circle where everything is real because I say it's real and um, like that that also isn't necessarily very healthy so one of the cool things about having a coven is that you sort of have this built-in sounding board you can measure especially when you're you're talking to the same gods or working with the same spirits in the same structure you can go hey I'm having this experience or this is what I think um, does this feel reasonable to you or how does this mesh up with what you're experiencing? Like it becomes an open conversation. And if it's with people who you love and trust, then that conversation becomes one of acceptance and encouragement rather than, oh, does this match up with, you know, the acceptable experience that you're all supposed to be having. Hmm. Um, so that coven, that coven, part of the reason they're there is to, um, they're encouraging your, your personal explorations, but they're also kind of keeping you in check in the sense that if you think that magic is real and if you think that witchcraft is real and we actually have power, then maybe it's possible that we actually can do some damage with it. Hmm. So it's nice having um, a safety net and a sounding board um, and a community so that you're not just talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. I suppose we should probably mention just talking about um, covens and group dynamics just for people who are watching um, that these group dynamics should be healthy in this way and if you ever oh, find yeah. yourself in a situation which is not healthy in this way that is usually people masquerading under the mask of witch or pagan or wiccan to hurt people just like people do in all communities like it's some people get into power and they use it to abuse so if you're feeling deeply uncomfortable or the group dynamics seem really off to you then that is not a healthy coven space and that is not yeah the experience that you should be having i think the dating analogy works again there too like you just because somebody says they're a high priestess i mean somebody might be totally legit it might be a 100 percent like lineaged coven and whatever tradition with whatever people vouching for it but it doesn't mean the group leaders don't suck mm. so like <laughs> when you are exploring a tradition whether it's wicca or it's something else you don't sacrifice your adulthood or your autonomy you get to walk away anytime you want and i think like sometimes it's worth reminding ourselves of those things especially when we're going into new situations if somebody strikes you as controlling or a jerk or you know, like, especially, you know, like we practice our rituals skyclad naked. So like, if you've got weird, like sexual, like uncomfortableness about somebody, it's 100% okay to just be like, nope, not doing it. See you guys later. Peace out. Mm -hmm. um, we forget that sometimes because I think we're so hungry for magic. Mm -hmm. But you've got to remind yourself, like, I'm an autonomous adult. You are not the boss of me. <laughs> like, um, yeah so if you if something feels gross you should leave yeah especially i think that's a big that's a big worry for some people because right. intuition is such a big part of being a witch being a pagan and then sometimes in group dynamics people's doubt their 
intuition it's, it's kind of like as beautiful as a sounding board can be in a healthy situation there can be like a shadow side of it in negative group yeah. situations where you feel the pressure not to listen to your own gut or listen to your intuition um yeah. in that situation so just just for balance's sake for people out there who who are worried about that like like Thorn already said you have all the power to just walk away and not partake in that you're not obligated um, yeah that's the thing to remember i also tell people you've got to maintain your other contacts you know participate in other communities mm. um i really encourage that seekers who approach me also begin therapy like with a licensed counselor just because man it's not super accessible here in the united states unfortunately but having a neutral person who can interact with you and help you sort of work through some of those things is really one of the best tools that you can have both just out in the world but also magically um so if you know you've got to keep your friends you know keep your talk to your spouse about what you're doing like obviously if there are oaths in place then respect those to some extent but it's not a question of just like forcing other people away you know mm -hmm. you want to keep all of those connections that's how you're going to be healthiest yeah I think that's a really good point. Uh, I think that a lot of people get so excited about the witch path or the pagan path um, and they get, they get very deep into it and it can be very deeply involving in a way that you kind of get lost in it um, yeah. because it can influence and affect every area of your life because it's magic. So of course it can, but it is easy to get lost in that. I think it's, it's one of the reasons too, and I don't know how controversial this is, but it's one of the reasons why I think that we should keep our mundane jobs. Mm. Like I know that there, there's a lot of pressure right now. So I'm, I'm a content creator, right? Like I have a Patreon. I wrote a book. Like I go speak at shit. Like there's, there's like money making opportunities in spirituality. Like that's just true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of, pr of pressure for content creators to, to pursue that, even if they don't want to. Like, mm. how, can you, how can you turn your love of tarot into a tarot biz? How can you mm. be a witch boss? And if you want to do that, and if that speaks to who you are, then that's awesome, like by mm. all means. But sometimes I think there's this pressure to monetize what we do. Um, and the idea is that, well, if I'm a professional witch, then I don't have to work a straight job. I can just be magical all the time. Mm. But even if we don't like our straight jobs, like I don't like my job all the time. But there are things that I learn in a job that I just couldn't learn if I wasn't working for the man. Mm. Like it's grounding, aside from like the financial stability and whatever, it puts me in conversation with people who what I would otherwise never meet. Mm. It helps me to explore power dynamics. Like I work in an office. Um, I learn a lot about teamwork. I learn a lot about pragmatism and practicality. And I think sometimes we just, we think that the whole goal is to get out of working a straight job, but in a lot of magical traditions, they require you to work a straight job mm. specifically for those reasons. So, you know, I get a lot out of mine, even though I don't like it all the time. Mm. See, I'm from the other perspective now because uh, I, that's kind of my job. <laughs> yeah, so I, know. I, I, I run a, I run a witch store and a patron and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. There is definitely still some elements where I definitely feel that you can, depending on what kind of job you're running, you can get that because, for example, the retailer. Yeah, um, the retailer part for me, um, there is some stuff that is boring, <laughs> so boring. And then I, I've had to learn things like proper using of spreadsheets and your proper tax yeah. returns and conversations with um people at the inland it's inland revenue or whatever the equivalent is um yeah. and you're you're doing all of that and you're like ugh, and, you're, and the people are like have a witch business it's gonna be all all, 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 all and i'm sat there like clearly you've never filed tax return <laughs> well yeah and i think that's the part that we miss like let's if i start a okay being an author is kind of like that being an author and being a writer is a different skill set than being a witch. Mm -hmm. Being a retailer, being a bookkeeper and an accountant is a different skill set than being a witch. 
And whatever it is, if you want to work professionally as a witch, like what other skill set are you trying to combine here? Um, and how good are you at this other sort of mundane thing? I think these are questions we don't ask ourselves. Like, oh, I really love tarot and I'm really good at reading it. I want to be a professional tarot reader. Okay, cool. But how do you deal with customers who don't want to pay or the guy who's harassing you at the divination fair or whatever? Like, how do you deal with that stuff? Because that has nothing to do with my love for tarot. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like those are the mundane stuff that I think we kind of need sometimes to ground us. Um, I'm using a different skill set as an author than I have as a priestess. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we conflate those things. Mm. I wonder if that's why quite a lot of, um, the witch type businesses that are, that people set out fail because oh. there is this oh, yeah. idea of, I'm just going to be like, I don't know, wandering around my house with all my bangles on and everything is going to be like very yeah. floaty, very light all the time. And actually it's massively stressful to run a business of any oh, business. Yeah. Well, I think too, that for a lot of witchy businesses, I think a lot of them, and I, so I worked, I worked in retail for 10 years before I did teaching and other things. So like I've, I've worked in sales. Um, and I worked at a guitar shop. I'm a musician. I went to music school. Like I love the guitar. And for a while I thought, oh, well, I could work. I could work in, in music retail. And my boss said to me, owning a guitar shop has nothing to do with loving guitars. Do you love business? That's what matters. And I was just like, oh, oh God. Okay. <laughs> um, I think for a lot of people who start out with witchy businesses, I think they don't understand their market sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because the people who are actually spending money on magical products are not, by and large, witches, mm -hmm. right? If I'm a witch and I already have a handle on divination, I'm not going to employ another tarot reader to read for me every month. I'm not going to do that. The mm -hmm. people who go and get readings all the time are people who they want to believe in magic they want to work in these kind of spaces, but they don't necessarily want to do it for themselves. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a thing. I see this in like brick and mortar style stores that only carry certain things that maybe appeal to practitioners, but most of the people walking in the door off the street, you know, they're there for kind of a show. Like they mm. want the sparkle of magic. And I think sometimes like, witches and pagans we we feel like we're we're talking down to people or we don't want to kind of like stoop to that level of selling to people who aren't witches you know who want they want the magic tricks and they want to be dazzled and they want to believe in the supernatural and the unbelievable so mm. like from a marketing perspective i think that's a really interesting conversation yeah i definitely have people who buy things from me because they're pretty and for no other reason yeah. than that and I think that's why a lot of the witchcraft things are grouped into themes that apply to people en masse. So you have things for love, you have things for healing. Um, you do have obviously things which get then even more niche, but the ones that most people know about, you know, is the love spells, the cursing and, yeah. and healing and money. Yeah. Because and if you put together like love spell kit, yeah. right? love spell kit is the thing that's going to sell. Okay. And it's not the hardened practitioner who's buying love spell kit. It's the, the curious person, the newbie, the person who's desperate for that love. Mm -hmm. Like they're the ones who are going to be interested in it. So like, if you want to be successful financially, you have to cater to that person. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can still, ca you can still carry things for the seasoned oh, totally, practitioner, totally, of, course. of course. But yeah, you have to realize that it's, it's not going to be, I don't know real witches all the time i guess <laughs> when it comes to business at least sure sure i think as an author i think that conversation comes around to the like whole how come there are no advanced books mm. well it's because those books don't sell it really is just math <laughs> like <laughs> the reason there are 700 billion books about how to be a witch really easily is because that's what people want people don't want your 300 page book about you know, this obscure medieval grimoire and how to, I mean, I want that book. Okay. But like, <laughs> um, but that's not what is going to sell on the shelves of Barnes and Noble. Mm. I mean, just go look at the top selling books on witchcraft on Amazon. It's not that advanced books aren't out there or that people aren't 
contemplating deep magic and theology, it's that writing is a business like any other, and that's what sells. Mm -hmm. I've actually, um, I've actually done videos where I was discussing concepts that I was just getting my head around later on in my path. And I was discussing and like, like talking it out on things. And I had people tell me I was just flat out making it up because they didn't understand it. <laughs> Oh, and and they were like i don't understand this so it, it's not and they li literally pretty much said that verbatim as the as the response to it. and i was like yeah this is this is exactly the same thing which is when you start talking about like deeper concepts very very openly there are definitely going to be a, a not everybody but there's going to be a mass of people who just that's not what they're there for they yeah. don't understand that level they, they don't want to go to that level maybe and I don't know that there's anything wrong with the people who are, are happy floating around at that, you know, the beginner level and they don't take it any deeper than that. Oh, me neither. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean to sound like I might be kind of dumping on those people because I'm not, I think those people are, are really critical. And I, you know what, a lot of them will become those hardened practitioners I was talking about. Um, I really think that magic is for everybody and some people they want to turn it into their lives they want to be initiates or priestesses or artists or whatever and immerse themselves in those communities but other people are really happy with the lives that they build for themselves where magic is on the periphery or it's entertainment or it's aesthetic and i don't think that there's anything wrong with those things hmm. um yeah so that's a whole rabbit hole. We have to be careful because yeah, we're, 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 we're approaching a mark where we need to, to stop really. And I'm like, oh, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, that's why I just stopped talking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Here go. Because the aesthetic thing is a whole rabbit hole, which, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like that I can buy pretty things more easily from more people. <laughs> that's exactly what I said. I had someone the other day who was ranting about Killstar and I'm like, I like being able to buy like my pretty black dresses with things <laughs> I do too <laughs> half of my clothes are from Hot Topic so I get it <laughs> I, I, I understand I understand that people want want things to mean something and it means something to them so they want it all to mean something but not everything is going to mean something <laughs> it's the world we live in <laughs> <laughs> So we will, I think, round it up there because we've gone on slightly longer than I was anticipating, but it's been Sorry, awesome. I have a lot of no, words. No, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was super excited. I think it's great. So thank you so much for coming and talking today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, have a very lovely rest of Beltane because that's when we're recording. It'll probably be a few days after when it goes up. Yes. Everybody stay safe and healthy. Mm-hmm. And I will make sure that all of Thorne's links are, as I said, down below. So if you want to check out her book or her channel, you can check out more links down below. And see you guys next time.